Hey everybody in YouTube. Um, this video is about a project that I uploaded a video on probably my second or third video ever about building a audio spectrum analyzer out of fluorescent display tubes. The problem was work gets in the way of course and I just didn't have time plus the Russian style meter displays that I had they were offset so they didn't have a very wide viewing angle you know and it just it just one thing after another and the, to make matters worse I designed the board to use a couple of chips that are obsolete now and, and I didn't order enough to complete the project because when I ordered them they were available at the time and uh, you know and, and because I put the project off for so long funding issues etc 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 you know I couldn't get the chips anymore so and actually there's two chips not only was the anode grid driver been discontinued but the chip that I chose to drive the filament which was an LM9022 guess what it's also discontinued and uh, that pretty much strike two you know and strike three was time and money so that project got put on hold and I've made several additional videos about other diverse topics and now that production has slowed down for the holidays at work and I'm not dog dead tired every time I come home and not really want to do nothing uh, I finally got time to pick this up so I have to recreate the project again so instead what I did was I picked up a bunch of these uh, really cheap in I think the Ukraine, but I can't remember, but these are not Ukrainian tubes. These are standard Futaba made in Japan. And supposedly this guy has some more of these, but I haven't been able to contact him, but I don't really need anymore. So um, I still have a few of these left over as spares. You know, I can build an, another smaller one, like five or six of them. But anyways, so this was actually in the Futaba catalog you could actually purchase these back in 78 79 when these were manufactured and i have never seen these used in an actual cassette deck i've never seen I, well i can't i can't say that i've never personally seen a cassette deck that used this exact tube you know much like i've never seen another vcr out there that would use this exact tube you see what i mean um, and uh, this one's made by NEC, which is another, it's a flat, it's a uh, fluorescent indicator panel. That's what FIP stands for. But that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is, is building a sp audio spectrum analyzer using these displays. Okay. So I, like I said, I got a bunch of these, uh, from, uh, Ukrainian eBayer and, uh, I want to use them in this format. So see this one. The two bars are in the center, so the viewing angle is much better from side to side. And that was a problem with the Russian ones. As soon as you'd go just just this much of an angle, you couldn't see the top bar anymore because on the Russian ones, everything was offset and it was it was just bad. So and at the time, uh, the other reason why I chose to use the Russian ones is because they were unique. Okay. This was at a time when Russian um, manufactured parts, you know, whether it was indicator panels or circuit boards or whatever it might have been, Nixie tubes, they weren't available on eBay. There was only a handful of stuff here and there. But then as of recently, the market is completely flooded with Russian stuff. So it's just not unique anymore. For example, the IN9, the IV18s, they made uh, the, the little seven dot uh, ice tube clock tubes. And I mean, they're all over. They're just not unique anymore. So that fa it's out of fashion, in my opinion. So I'll just go back to standards. And this, since this one is unique, you're not going to see them anymore. So I'll, I'll decide to uh, use this one. So I have a bunch of these. And then I finally got around to making these boards here. So the idea of engineering behind this is to use a couple of anode drivers that I can still get my hands on and they are still available as the recording of this video was made. You can still purchase these chips. Matter of fact, these are the chips right here. I haven't even opened them yet. They are, um, if I don't turn them upside down, they are uh, 
SN65512CNs. Those are high voltage, positive voltage, not negative voltage, positive voltage fluorescent display driver ICs. I bought a bunch of these and there were still another hundred or so left on Jamico when I bought these. I was gonna buy out the entire supply, but I changed my mind because I don't need the entire supply and I wanna save room for other people. You know, I don't wanna be a hoarder and just buy it all and everybody loses except for me. Uh, that's not who I am. So I left, there's still 140 of them as of today, still on Jamico, you can still get these. So if someone wants to build one of their own or build a fluorescent clock or something like that, the only chip that you could purchase on the market that's still readily manufactured is from Maxim Semiconductor. The 6921 series, I think it's what it's called. I, I, off the top of my head. And they're, they're expensive. They're very expensive chips. So you can get these for a little less than a dollar. Maybe a little over a dollar. I don't remember. It was right around a dollar a chip. They were cheap. So I bought a handful of them. Because the board that I designed uses two of them. And basically the, the, the idea behind this was I was going to make these a dumb tile style board. So you have an array of these guys driven off of two register chips, you know, shift register, high voltage drivers, and you have an input in it. So if you have a bunch of these that are daisy chained to build a spectrum analyzer, you have an input and an output. So your, your data bit, your, your data clock strobe and your necessary shift register pins come in here. And then that goes to a data input and then output to input and then output back through here to go to the next board. So it just becomes effectively one big serial shift register. And then the power connection is separate. That contains the five volts needed for the chips to operate, the high voltage needed for the anodes to operate and the two filament voltage pins, which are coming off of here too, okay? So these are all gonna get hooked up to this board here. This board was designed with several ideas in mind and I don't know if it's all gonna work correctly or not, but this was designed to use 12 to 15 volts DC input depending on how bright you want these displays to operate because these displays are not multiplexed, they're static. So even a measly 12 volts will give you a nice bright display, but if you want it brighter, you can run it 15 to 18, but I wouldn't recommend anything over that because um, you'll eventually burn the phosphors in and the circuit's really not designed to do that. So anyway, so I have my DC jack here and then my fuse, input fuse over here. Uh, this, this jumper here goes to the input of my driver boards. Basically, the way this thing works is this is an app mega processor designed to run the, the 32 channel DFT calculations. But the issue is the DFT takes so much processing time that I don't have enough time to drive the shift registers at the same time. It just takes so much time. So what I'm doing is I calculate the DFT. This is the audio amplifier and filtration circuitry along with the uh, potentiometer, the adjustment gain potentiometer and then your RCA jacks, whatever. So you got your, your filter network and amplifier networks here. Then this does all the calculations, it builds an array. And the array is then just transmitted to this microcontroller over here. And this microcontroller's job is to take the array and break it up and send the correct information over the chain to drive the display tubes. It reads the array and just shifts them out. That's all it does. And the other thing that it does is this creates the PWM signals for this chip here. And actually, this chip is a an H-Bridge driver IC, which is a very common off-the-shelf chip used for robotics or et cetera. And it's a full H-Bridge control. And the good thing about an H-Bridge control is this gives me the ability to drive the filaments. It's coming through these group of resistors. That way I can drop the voltage. And this drives the filaments. Because you got to think I have a large array of these uh, tubes and those tubes are going to consume a lot of current on the filaments. So to deal with that, you, there, there, well actually there's two ways to deal with it. You have a big honking transformer that can deliver high currents at say 3 volts AC, 3.5 volts AC, and yeah, good luck with that. 
you don't want to use DC because then you get a gradation, a brightness gradation across the screen. So it'll be brighter over here and dimmer over there or vice versa, depending on how you hook up these two filament wires. So I want to get around that. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a square wave 180 degrees out of phase from each other on the H-Bridge driver. And it's referenced to ground through this resistor here. And it actually this resistor will allow it to float slightly above ground so I can drive the tubes into cutoff so you don't get ghosting. So basically this creates a square wave of a certain cycle depending on how I have the frequency set in here. So I create a square wave from this chip here to drive this and it creates an alternating frequency or, or yeah, alternating current AC across the filament like it would if you had a line voltage, a sine wave. It'd be a square wave instead of a sine wave, but it doesn't really matter. And that will solve the problem. And this chip is big enough with a heat sink on it to handle the current across the array. And actually, once you assemble all these boards together, this is what you end up with. Isn't that just cool? So there's your there's the spectrum analyzer that's going to fit in my enclosure, and uh, from a distance it actually looks quite like quite nice. So I can turn these center indicators on or not and just leave the bars, or I can turn the indicators on. It's completely up to me. And this is the array. So what we'll have is we'll have an input here, and it just you'll be jumping off, and then with little tin pin ribbons all the way across and then your power is just jumper, 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 jumper all the way down. And it eventually plugs into this board here. But because we have a load of that many displays, we have to be able to handle the filament current and this is the only way that I could foresee doing it in a small enough package is using this chip here. So that should be able to drive because all the filaments are in parallel. So that should be able to handle the current. So when this, when this microcontroller fires up, sets up the output timers for the PWM mode to drive this, this chip. And the reason why I say PWM is because not only will this resistors help, but PWM I can change the pulse width. Because uh, I have two outputs, output compare register A and B, B being inverse of A. So that way the H bridge will function correctly. Then... I can change the PWM, which will actually lower the voltage across the filaments to where exactly I need it. So that makes this extremely adaptable to tubes. So this has an input voltage of 18 volts or 12 volts or whatever I decide to use there. I'm going to start with 12 volts to keep things simple. It's going to have 12 volts in. So if I drive this blindly with 50% square wave, I'm going to get roughly 12 volts, anywhere between 6 to 12 volts across these two pins, which is way too much. So what I have to do is I have to narrow the pulse width, say 30%, 25%, 20%, and that'll drop the voltage across the filaments just enough to where you get emission. And, and, and the, to drive the filaments on these displays, there is a, a finesse, there's, there's a sweet spot. You want the filaments burning just hot enough to where you're getting full emission, but not hot enough to where they're visibly seen because you do not want to see these glowing red. Under no circumstance do these filaments ever glow red. If they glow red, you have to be in a pitch black room. If they glow red in a, uh, in a standardly lit room, they're too hot, okay? Which will shorten the lifetime of the filaments and the two overall the tube. And you don't want to burn them too cold either because if you burn them too cold, you won't get as much emission, but... It is just as bad on the lifetime of the tube to burn them cold as it is to burn them too hot. Because if you burn them too cold, then they oxidize because the, even though this is a vacuum, there's still a little bit of deposits in there, which are constantly being absorbed by the getter. Uh, and I forget the exact theory on it, but if you do burn them too cold, they will shorten the lifetime of the tube. You'll start to lose emission over time. Same thing if you burn them too hot. So you, there's really a finesse, there's a sweet spot in... Basically, the way you figure that out is you they glow red only in pitch black, a pitch black situation. So what you do is you bring the voltage up to where you have maximum brightness and you stop there. And what you need to do is you need to check in the lit room to see if these filaments are glowing. If not, make sure, like, wait till nighttime or walk into a closet or whatever so it's pitch black. You can't see your hand in front of you. Then you'll see them finally glowing red. Okay, and then that's perfect. Once you have that, you're good. 
an anode voltage on this tube since I explained before that it's not multiplexed that it's a static tube the anode voltage is anywhere between 12 to 15 of a maximum of 18 volts so and there you have it that's all there is to it now it's just a matter of I was test fitting this together so then I can take the nuts off here and have standoffs going through the side of the cabinet and the same thing on this I can have screws coming in from the side of the cabinet and these standoffs you can buy from China I you know I didn't have these custom cut these are off the shelf which is amazing because with the width of the tube the circuit board look at the clearance I mean that is just tight but it's not touching so with the clearance of the tubes where they stand off from the board the thickness of the board and these standoffs are almost exact it's almost like it fits like a glove almost like it's calculated but I can tell you right now it's not so there might be some stuff touching but I don't think so they're close but they are definitely not touching so uh thank you for watching there this will be a multi-part video so once i start ordering in parts to assemble these boards flash the firmware debug test blah 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 and get the sucker running i'll start making more videos but until then if you have any comments please feel free to leave one thank you for watching